Um, due to developments across our country and the world, we as a group of Cornell graduate students and early career professionals felt the need to dedicate our theme this year to diversity, equity, and inclusion in paleontology. We hope the presentations and Q&A panels today will foster meaningful conversation and invoke change in our field. So welcome to session one of today's program. Uh, and let me introduce uh, Matthew Pruden, who will be the moderator for this session. Great, thank you for that, Jaylee. Uh, so yeah, welcome everyone to the first session of uh, today's uh, symposium. Uh, as Jaylee mentioned, my name is Matthew and I'll be the moderator. Uh, working, I also have several people working with me behind the scenes to moderate the Q&A, the chat, uh, as well as to handle any and all technical issues. So the session will be recorded uh, and is being recorded right now and will then be later uploaded onto the uh, PRI's YouTube channel uh, and captioning services will be provided. Now, we do ask that uh, you, the attendees, please do not uh, record, take screenshots or photographs of the presentations unless uh, the speaker has said you can do so. I wanna thank you all for joining us and thank all of our uh, speakers for this session. Each speaker will be given 20 minutes to present followed by five minutes for a Q&A. And then after that, there will be a five minute break while we help set up the next speaker. Um, we suggest to help avoid Zoom fatigue that you take that five minutes to get up, stretch, uh, move around and grab a drink if, need, if you need to. Now, after, the, uh, after all of our speakers have presented, we will then move on to our 30 minute Q&A panel uh, where we will invite all of the speakers back. So if you have any questions for our speakers, please direct them to the Q&A chat feature found at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question for a specific speaker, please note their name in the question. Uh, otherwise, we will ask the question to all of the speakers during the panel. There is also a chat feature as well. Um, I'm seeing it being populated by everyone introducing themselves. It's great to see you all. Uh, the chat feature is there for you to let us know if there's any technical issues, um, as well as to have the ability to converse with your fellow attendee. Uh, we do ask that you use this justly and uh, without any malicious intent, uh, any malicious misuse of the chat feature may result in you being removed from the uh, session uh, and or as well having the chat feature disabled. Now, if you want any more information on that, please review the code of conduct on the PRI website. Now, I also ask that you all bear with us as we navigate uh, this virtual symposium. Uh, for me and the uh, grad students, early career professionals, this is our first time running such an event. Uh, so if for any reason Zoom does crash, uh, we will make sure to get it back up as quickly as possible and we ask that you reuse the link that you used uh, to first join to get back in. Uh, if for whatever reason your link does not work, uh, then you will have to re-register through the PRI website. So uh, with that, I hope you enjoy the session. Our first speaker today is Mr. Cameron Muskley. He is a part of the Paleontology Association of Georgia and is also the recipient of PRI's 2020 uh, Catherine Palmer Award which is awarded to those for their excellence of contributions to the field. Uh, Cam will be presenting on the importance of paleontology education outreach in Georgia. Cam? Thank you very much for having me. I greatly appreciate it. Let me share my screen. All right, can everybody see that? Okay. Awesome. So today we're going to be talking about the importance of paleontology in Georgia and the things that I have been doing in order to share uh, my passion to the, to the state of Georgia. And so let's talk about passion. Let's talk about where I um, got my start in paleontology. Um, if you if you see right here, this is me when I was about probably maybe six or seven years old and where that blue arrow is actually pointing is me holding a dinosaur right in my hand. Um, I've been fascinated by dinosaurs and prehistoric life ever since I can remember. Um, I've always had a fascination with the past and prehistoric history. 
And I've always had a fascination with things going extinct and why things go and why things went extinct. And so I had that passion in me um, at, at, at a very uh, early age in paleontology. And it really didn't, I really didn't know that I wanted to be a paleontologist until I actually found my first fossil and until a teacher actually exposed the fossil collection to me. So the story goes that I was in, I was in the second grade at the time. And if I was on my good behavior, um, there was a fourth grade teacher at the time who had a personal fossil collection. And so I was able to take a trip down to her classroom and I was able to look and explore some of the fossils that she had in her collection. And in those various drawers, she had things like trilobites, plant fossils, um, but the fossil that I remember the most was a crinoid stem that she actually gave to me after, after um, I took the tour. And after that, I knew I really wanted to be a paleontologist. And I also started to learn about starting to connect geology and paleontology together. Um, I taught myself how to identify rocks and minerals. Um, I started collecting rocks and minerals at a very early age and really started to get an understanding of the foundation of uh, geology and paleontology and try to connect those two disciplines together, um, learning how to, um, how to identify rocks and understand the rocks around you to better understand the history of the earth and eventually um, paleontology, which is a combination of biology and geology. And so um, this photo right here is uh, where I was, um, I was probably about maybe 12 or 13 years old at the time. Uh, with my uh, first fossil collection, setting it up in my room. And this is what my collection looks like today, or at least part of it looks like today. Very um, detailed, very, um, you can identify the various fossils and they're very catal and they're cataloged very well. Um, so this is what it looks like right now. Oh, so just to give you an update um, on the uh, paleontology of Georgia, um, it's not really that famous compared to other places like places like Montana or Wyoming that has a great ge geographical range and large mountains where geology is exposed. Um, our geology is a little bit more different and our fossils are a little bit more different as well. Um, it, it, the Georgia is broken down into various different um, geographical locations. And so right over here um, near the coastal plains, you'll find things like um, marine, mostly Cenozoic marine fossils, um, Pleistocene marine fossils, and uh, Pleistocene land mammal fossils like mammoths and mastodons and things like that. You'll also find a lot of Eocene fossils of that nature like sand dollars and scallops and things of that nature. Right near the fall line is actually where you'll find a lot of the Cretaceous material like dinosaurs, plesiosaurs, mosasaurs, um, even uh, marine birds. Um, you also have a uh, uh, a couple of fish and other things of that nature. But what I collect the most is up here. This is where the Appalachian region, um, the Piedmont region is where I live and it has a lot of igneous and metamorphic rocks with no fossils. So this is where I grew up and where I currently live right now. Um, but I've also traveled up here near the Appalachian region where you'll find some of the Georgia's oldest fossils, archaeocyathids. You'll also find things like Carboniferous fossils, plant fossils. You'll also find maybe reptilian trackways that occur in the Carboniferous. You'll also find a couple of Ordovician fossils and even uh, Cambrian trilobites. So those are where the rocks are exposed, where I have done a lot of my work in Paleozoic, Paleozoic geology and paleontology. And again, this just gives you an up, uh, a look of what, Georgia's, what Georgia has to offer when it comes to fossil material. Um, this is a trilobite that I found a couple of years ago. Um, this is a Cretaceous oyster um, that was found near the fall line in Georgia. And this is actually a, a, a dinosaur tooth, uh, Appalachiosaurus um, tyrannosauroid tooth that was actually discovered um, in near the fall line in Georgia as well. So Georgia has a pretty good um, geological and paleontological record, our fossil record, yet it doesn't get a lot of attention, but we do have some pretty great fossils um, coming from this state. And so I kind of really wanted to talk about the things that I have been doing in trying to get Georgia paleontology on the map and trying to um, bring paleontology to the general public. Um, when I was growing up, I didn't have any of those places where I can actually learn about geology. Um, I lived in an area where it wasn't that great when it came to understanding geology. No one was doing um, any geology or any big projects in paleontology at the time. And not a lot of people knew about the various fossils that come from the state. So I wanted to take it upon myself to try to help others and try to bring paleontology to the general public in my state. 
And so this photo here shows me teaching about dinosaurs in Mensville Elementary School. And it was actually the, my second grade teacher um, who brought, who wanted to bring me along and invited me to her classroom and teach their, um, teach their, uh, their classroom about paleontology and dinosaurs. And so I went there and I taught about um, their class on dinosaurs. And so that was very fun for me to do. And they also had a great experience learning about various extinct organisms that live not just in Georgia, but also in the various past. Um, a little bit uh, back in uh, 2019, I actually did, a, 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 I typically go to this particular classroom or this particular school, it's called um, the Puckettsville Elementary School, and I like to bring my personal fossil collection and lay it down on the table by geological order for, for people who can have a better understanding of deep time and how old the earth actually is based on the fossil and rock content from my personal collection. And so this it was a picture that was taken last year on uh, it was a table set up and I was typically going to that school and I would set up fossils for my personal collection from the oldest fossils to some of the younger fossils and so these are children and parents who are interacting with the various fossil specimens on the table. I also have a traveling exhibit um, I it's called Cam's Fossil Jam I set up at the Fernbank Science Center um, about maybe two Saturdays a month um, unfortunately, I have not been able to do that this year, uh, unfortunately, uh, due to COVID, but I hopefully get to do that next year. And it, it's uh, very fun and exciting. I started this actually back in 2016. And back in 2016, it was kind of an experiment and it took off from there. And so every about two Saturdays a month or three Saturdays a month, I would go to the Fernbank Science Center and I would set up my personal fossil collection. I really, want, I really wanted to give people an understanding of how diverse geology and paleontology is, and some of the various fossils that you could find just in the state of Lone, just in the state of Lone, and sometimes in your backyard if the right rocks are exposed. And so here you have uh, what, the, uh, what the table would set up. Here you have kids interacting and parents interacting with um, some of the various rocks and minerals on the table. Um, here is a good um, section or a good layout of what the table used to look like or what the table has looked like. Um, this table is actually set up um, for uh, the Cretaceous period or the Mesozoic era. I like to take a various, uh, take various different geological time periods and um, bring them out so people can have an understanding of what the life used to be hundreds of millions of years ago based on fossil content. And over here, um, this was back when I first did my uh, in my talk in 2016, this is actually Dr. Tony Martin, a good friend of mine and a paleontologist who's in the Atlanta area who came in and um, supported me on my first, um, my first volunteer work as being um, setting up at the museum. So it was very fun to, very fun to see him and, and, do, and do these type of activities. Um, I also am part of the Atlanta Geological Society and I have given various talks earlier this year. I gave a talk at the Fernbank Science Center um, and we were talking about just various geological formations and, and geological time. And so here, um, I was doing this this year, it's called um, Fernbank on the Rocks and they invited the Atlanta Geological Society and we set up various fossils. So we were talking about paleontology. Um, on this, on the left screen here is a picture of me um, giving a talk on dinosaurs. And um, one of the things that I'm quite interested in uh, is uh, the Appalachian dinosaur region. So the dinosaurs found in the southeastern part of the United States. And I gave a talk on that um, back, in, back in 2017 on the various dinosaur fossils that have been uh, discovered in the southeastern part of the United States. So I'm also part of the Paleontological or Paleontology Association of Georgia. This is a relatively new organization that was just um, organized by maybe about two or three years ago. And it's ran by um, Ashley Quinn, who is the interim pre uh, president and the collections manager um, at the Georgia College Museum. Um, it's also where the current president right now was Hank, um, Hank Jose, and then the vice president of the um, organization is Thomas Thurman. And so the Paleontology Association was really um, put together to really uh, express the importance of fossil conservation and promote the interest of paleontology 
and natural history of, of this state because this state is not, uh, it doesn't get a lot of things on the map because of its paleontology and because of its geology. And so we wanted to really uh, take a step further and create an organization that allows people to interact with these, um, with fossil resources and natural history. Um, like I said, I didn't have any of these particular types of resources when I was growing up having an interest in paleontology. So it was really hard for me to try to get those uh, and, and try to find organizations like this um, that had people who were interested in paleontology. And right now we have an organization, um, the Paleontology Associ Paleontology Association of Georgia, that has these particular um, events. Um, they go on field trips. You, we do a lot of uh, public outreach. Um, so these are some of the various different photos of public outreach. And we also do field work as well. And we also try to help people to better understand the geology of the Georgia and have a better understanding of deep time. So the next part I want to talk about is the representation in diversity and paleontology. And right here is a photo from a relatively new show called Dino Hunters. And I put a big X, I put a big cancel sign by it because you can see here, paleontology has changed over the years. Um, during, this photo actually shows uh, what, quote unquote, what paleontologist looks like. And that's not what a paleontologist looks like. Um, that is the old version of what a paleontologist looks like. It's the, the cowboy, um, straight white male kind of, kind of person um, that representates uh, paleontology. And paleontology is actually trying to get away from that. We're trying to get away from those various stereotypes, the Indiana Jones, Alan Grant type stereotypes. And, ha and I have an arrow here that actually points to some various people who are actually paleontologists from the field. Um, this is my friend, Kate Marriott, who is a invertebrate paleontologist and a paleo artist. Um, this is my uh, friend, Dr. Lisa White, who's a micropaleontologist. Um, Aaron Woodruff, who's a vertebrate and, mam and mammalian paleontologist, and, and Evan Johnson Ramson, who is a um, vertebrate paleontologist and a dinosaur paleontologist. Here I have some other various people who are part of that diverse community in paleontology. Um, this is Candace Simon, another vertebrate paleontologist. Um, Alec Blaines, who is a vertebrate paleontologist, who is also on the autism spectrum, just like, I ha just like how I am and he's also on the uh, part of the LGBTQ community. And I have my good friend, um, Jonathan Maledin, who is a paleontology and, ge and geology major as well. So there was a recent, um, this actually table stuck out to me. So back in 2017, um, the, paleontology the Paleontological Association um, did a diverse diversity study between um, ecologists and paleontologists from the British Geological from the British um, Ecological Society comparing their diversity within the, um, the Paleontological Association. And these numbers were staggering. They were honestly disappointing to me. Um, so if you look at the chart here, you'll have a comparison between paleontologists from um, the Paleontological Association, comparing them to the British Ecological Society and looking at their numbers in regards to ethnic diversity. And it seems that yes, the ecologists have are seventy three percent white, but and in the paleontology it's about eighty six percent. But if you look at the African American, Black, Caribbean, um, we only have one percent of African American uh, paleontologists that are represented in the Paleontological Association. The British Ecological Society has a little bit more higher diversity. It's about 6%. So if you look at the 1% here, we are very low in regards to that number. And even when it comes to uh, um, neurodiversity, when it talks about physical and mental disabilities, we are still quite low in regards to the British Ecological Society that has a much higher um, number, that has a much higher percentage of people who have mental and physical disabilities. Um, so paleontology has a lot of work to do in regards to ethnic diversity and neurodiversity in the, in this, in the science. So you're a scientist. I, I get that question all the time when I'm doing presentations, when I'm talking about paleontology to the general public. And this old thing about scientists and what a scientist looks like is, you know, the frizzy hair like character with test tubes, kind of like a mad scientist. That's not what a scientist is. Um, there are plenty of scientists who are on the who are on the autism spectrum, like like myself, 
who are African American, who are Asian, who are do, for, from these various broad walks of life. Um, and we also we need to change the stereotype of what a scientist looks like and what a scientist is. I think when people get an idea of what a scientist is, like I said, they get an idea of a mad scientist with you know test tubes and beakers and a lab coat. That's not what a scientist is in a lot of cases. Um, not, not all scientists are you know white men who have crazy hair and test tubes. And I think we need to change that stereotype and we need to change that look of what a scientist looks like. There are plenty of scientists who are, who are part of the LGBTQ community, who are, um, who are have physical and mental disabilities, who um, are come from different countries. And so we need to better um, talk about that and we need to better spread that particular image of what a scientist looks like. So there's many people that may not feel like they have the chance to be in science based on socioeconomic um, factors. And that's one of the reasons um, for me, uh, I felt like because I wasn't in a place where I could afford to go to school, that it was keeping me from becoming a paleontologist. But I had to find those ways on my own and had to put myself out there much uh, in a much broader light. So I could, you know, not talk, not think about those socioeconomic factors that are keeping me from being a scientist. That I can be a scientist doesn't doesn't matter what your socioeconomic background doesn't matter what your race is doesn't matter it doesn't matter what your um, sexual orientation is. Everybody should have a chance to become a scientist. But we need to represent those various people who may not have those uh, may not have the the money to go to school may not have. Um, who not may be or not might not might be around um, various diversity of people. So we need to change what a scientist is, and we need to change the definition and the picture of what a scientist looks like. So earlier this year, I did win the Catherine Palmer Award of Paleontology, and this is something that I really, I honestly had didn't see it coming at all. And you know, I, I've done a lot of work in regards to science communication and paleontology, and trying to. Um, figure out uh, ways that I could become a paleontologist and working on that particular goal in my life. And so winning the Catherine Palmer Award was a ginormous honor for me. Um, and it also represents diversity as well because I am the first African American to win this particular award and I am the first recipient of with autism to win this award. And so this was a big thing that I didn't realize um, was such an important thing. And of course, this won't be the last. I will not be the first African, I will not be the last African American who will win this particular uh, award. There will be gonna be lots of other people who are gonna win this award who look very different from other, the various people um, who look like, um, it has that definition of what, not what a scientist would look like. And winning this award for me has really pushed me in an area where I talk a lot more about um, paleontology in regards to the representation of that particular field, in regards to ethnic diversity, neurodiversity. And the, this award actually has actually helped me um, talk about those various things that I wasn't talking about more, that I wasn't talking about a lot in the past. So winning this award has definitely helped me in regards to furthering my career and furthering my dreams of becoming a paleontologist and historical geologist. So I want to thank these various organizations, the, uh, the Paleontological Research Institution um, for hosting this, um, for hosting this symposium and also for presenting me with the uh, Catherine Palm Award. Um, I want to give a shout out to the uh, Paleontology Association of Georgia, um, to Time Scavengers as well, um, to the paleontology, um, to the Paleontological Society and the Paleontolo Paleontological Association. Um, I also want to thank you um, for my various parents and the various teachers who have been very, very supportive of me uh, over the various years and the various scientists over the years as well. And with that, I will take questions if anybody has any. Great, thank you so much, Cameron. Uh, yeah, so it is now time for uh, you to ask your questions uh, for Cam. Uh, so please use the Q&A chat feature. Uh, so I have a couple questions to start out with. Um, one of them was, uh, I wanted to ask you to share your thoughts on your experience on working with non-academic organizations when it comes to uh, educational outreach. Thank you. Um, working with non-academic um, organizations have been uh, has been very quite interesting to me. Um, 
it hasn't been like say um that's a hard question to ask <laughs> it's hard to ask. but um for me it's been quite interesting because there are people who want to learn about these various t uh, fields of science but may not have a quite understanding or may not have that formal training in order to understand the various information on a higher level. And so I try to try to put it in a way where various people can understand. So let's say we're talking about deep time in regards to geology and many people may not be a very um, sound when it comes to geology. They may not know anything when it comes to geology. So I try to take a subject like that, a much larger subject like that and try to stretch it out in a way for people can understand it a lot better where from a PhD geologist or a PhD paleontologist may not also be, you know, there may be a geologist out there that may not have good communication skills um, to try to communicate their science. And so I, what I try to do to bring those um, non-academic organizations is I try to use um, what I've known over the years and try to bring that information, um, a much broader information and try to lay it out for, uh, for others can understand. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, one of the questions from our audience is, uh, how does it feel to be a, a role model, uh, you know, inspiration for those that are underrepresented in, in paleontology? And how do you sort of use that to, to reach out to them and help them along in their, their career paths? Um, for me, it feels kind of new. Um, <laughs> it's something that I wasn't thinking about over the years, you know, I've always thought about fossils and paleontology, but I really didn't think about paleontology as such a broader, having different branches and having a broader uh, um, understanding of the field in regards to um, socioeconomic values and various things and diversity. And so for me, I'm glad that I am a role model to various other people because there are people in my state who may be on the autism spectrum or also who, um, are African American who don't have those various um, places where they can um, further their interests or passion in paleontology or just in science in general. And so being able to help others who are, who are typically looked at as less than um, is a, a good advantage that I try to use in order to help others who, um, who are definitely part of that minority, minority groups. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, to help with time, we do have time for one more question. Uh, so if your question wasn't answered, don't worry, uh, we'll bring them back up during the Q&A panel discussion at the end. Um, one of the uh, other questions that was asked is, what uh, do you see as uh, your future goals, uh, both short-term and long-term? Good question, good question. Uh, I'm still actually, I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, so for short-term goals, I definitely want to um, get more people in, in regards to people of color and uh, people who have physical or mental disabilities in science or have an interest in paleontology. I want to, have, I want to be able to help them um, have those opportunities that I was lacking because of you know, either social economic um, situations or um, being, uh, being an African-American male um, because Atlanta is a very um, diverse place. It's, there's a lot of African-American culture. There's a lot of African-American people that live in the Atlanta area, but you can, but there are not many African-American people who really take an interest or even have that, um, have those opportunities in science and paleontology. So that, those are one of my short-term goals. My long-term goals is definitely continue my education and, and definitely, um, continue, um, chasing after from what I've been wanting to do since I was three years old is becoming a paleontologist. Great, thank you so much, Cameron. Uh, and thank you to all of those that have sent in questions. Um, we will be taking a short uh, three to four minute break uh, while we help set up our next uh, presentation. So take this opportunity to get up and stretch. And remember, uh, if we weren't able to get back to your questions, we do have our Q&A panel at the end of this session. Thank you.
All right. Uh, it is now time for our second uh, presentation for this session. Uh, so our second presentation will be by Dr. Chris Atchison, who is a um, who is a uh, associate professor of geosciences education for the Department of Geology at the University of Cincinnati. He uh, focuses much of his research on fostering full access um, and inclusion in earth sciences for those who have sensory orthopedic and developmental uh, disabilities. Uh, Chris's talk today is titled Diversity, Equity, and Exclusion, the community-focused effort to broaden participation in the field-focused science disciplines. Chris, take it away. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon or good evening. I see we have a lot of folks from all over the world. It's very nice to, uh, to be able to spend time with all of you. Um, so my talk is going to, uh, to, to focus on what I've learned um, a lot through, uh, through the years of doing this research. I also want to kind of uh, piggyback on what Cam was talking about in terms of identity. Um, certainly, I am not the uh, I am not the image of diversity uh, in terms of what we're talking about today. And so, I want us all to realize that we each look at diff diversity and broadening participation uh, very differently. Um, but also, as you'll see from the talk that I give this morning, that diversity uh, is all around us, even when we don't see it all the time. Um, and so, uh, and, and, to, and to, to add to that, I want us to all to realize that, too, I'm not an expert here. All right, I've been asked to participate. I've been asked to share what I've known and what I've learned along the way. I'm not an expert. I've done this work for a long time. But I've, everything that I've learned and everything that I've done has been with the experts and the experts that I've worked with, and those are the students, the students with disabilities that I've had the pleasure to work with and who have been patient enough to teach me along the way. So I ask all of us to consider um, the expertise of those who, are, who we work with. And a lot of the times, the students that we're working with and the perspectives they bring are the experts. So what I would like us all to consider at right now, we all come from different perspectives of science. I want you to consider your classroom. I want you to consider your laboratories. A lot of us are in museums right now. Consider the spaces that you have in the museums. Consider the field activities and experiences that you've all done. Just take a minute and put yourself into that space. And think about what the challenges and barriers to participation in those spaces are for someone who does not look like you, who does not think like you, who might not walk or see or hear like you do, who might not socialize like you do. What are the challenges for those individuals in the space that you're considering. Academic challenges, cultural challenges, domestic, emotional, physical, sensory, social, socioeconomic. Think about those challenges for a minute. We all come to, we all have a sense of privilege, especially where we are. The fact that we're on this call this morning is a huge sense of privilege. Um, that a lot of times because of that privilege, we're not able to see other people's barriers or the barriers that prevent other people from participating in things. So what I'm really asking you all to do right now is just to stay open-minded and consider that the way that you do things certainly isn't the way that everyone does things. So do your best to keep to stay open-minded as we talk about this today. One of those things that I'm, that I'm referring to here is how many students or colleagues that we work with day in and day out have a disability. You might be surprised to know that one out of every five, 20% of people in the United States have a documented disability of some kind. That's a documented disability. That's not even talking about people who are not documenting a disability for fear of stigma or stereotype or bias. 
These are people who have a documented disability uh, to receive support services for that. More than one in every three American households have a member with a disability, have a, have a family member with a disability. And think about the fact that there are one billion individuals with disabilities around the world. This is from the American Association of people, for People with Disabilities. Also understand this, that one out of every five, that's, this is something I really want us to think about. One about it out of every five. Think about a lecture where you might have a lecture hall where you might have 100 students in that lecture hall. You might be surprised to know that 20% of those students have a disability. 20%. Are you reaching them? Are they getting the content that you're sharing in those lecture halls? Or are you just teaching the way you would teach to every student? Just because you don't see the disability, that you don't physically see someone with a disability does not mean that they're not there. How are we supporting them? Every single one of us on the call today, every single one of us that we work with, we all fall on a continuum of ability, right? All on the spectrum of how we see, hear, learn, walk, how we read, how we write, how we communicate verbally, how we socialize, how we're able to tune out distraction, and how we're able to manage physical and mental health, amongst many, many other things. We all fall on this spectrum of ability. So let's think about our science or discipline, right? These images are specific to geology. It's not, not, not completely specific to paleontology, although a lot of this might not look very different. But I want you to think about these images. These are images that have been taken off of geoscience websites directly. Right? What is it that we're portraying by promoting images like these? For someone who physically can't climb, we're certainly portraying a discipline that is not for them. You have to be physically rugged to be able to participate in this science. Right? So when we think about our field experiences, are we actually marginalizing students that we're not reaching by, by not even by talking to them, not even by, by the messages that we're sending? For many of our students, doing and experiencing field studies are often just as much of a rite of passage than they are a transformational learning experience. So is that the message that we're trying to send? You know, so I look up some, you know, I, I couldn't go without some images for paleontologists. And the, the one in the top left corner, um, that's my image of a paleontologist. And so I had to throw that one in there. But what we see here, we see in the top right corner, there's people that are doing uh, lab work. They're probably prepping uh, uh, fossils. People in the bottom image, uh, this was from... Uh, the site, Appalachian State University's uh, paleontology site. But even as you see this, you, you see in, in paleontology, there is a much more diversity of opportunity for people who might have a disability, um, uh, people who have diverse interests in the science, people who maybe they don't wanna be in the field or maybe they don't wanna be in the lab. There's opportunities. But you see, we portray these images. We don't portray a lot of the images of being in a lab. We portray a lot of the field-based images because they somehow seem to be more exciting than the other, right? We portray what we believe everyone else wants to see. So if I like to go in the field, I'm going to put all kinds of images up of people in the field doing exciting um, I doing exciting things and then somehow anything other than that is not as adventurous or not as exciting. So keep in mind the types of images that we're sharing. So I want us to consider this. Diversity is not the issue here. 
we have a symposium today that talks about diversity. Diversity is not the issue. The lack of access, equity, inclusion, social justice, and opportunity are the main issues. I'm sure there are others, believe me. But the lack of opportunity, the lack of opportunity for our students to pursue their passions, their interests, and their ideas that might not always align to what our departments are, portray are portraying to be the most ideal path to a career. I always like this quote, when you plant lettuce and if the lettuce doesn't grow well, do you blame the lettuce? Or do you look for reasons that it's not doing well? You know, lettuce is a pretty easy thing to plant and to grow. If the lettuce isn't doing well, it's probably the environment. And so I want us all to consider this as well. Disability is not a deficit in the individual, although it's often portrayed as such. It's an environmental deficit. If our students are struggling to learn something, do you speak slower and louder until they get it? Or do you find a new way to get the information to them? Do you find a new way to explain what it is you're trying to share with them? Paul Healy and Harrison in 2002 came out and said a student's identity within the geosciences is profoundly shaped by field studies. Profoundly shaped by field studies. Therefore, students who don't have the opportunity, think about this, if you don't have an opportunity to do field studies, where's your identity? Do you feel like you belong? Is there a sense of belonging there? Do you feel like this is something you can do? There's a whole lot of uh, other career paths in the geosciences that do not look at field studies. Think about this. Nothing about us without us. This is probably something many of you have heard. This goes back to the idea of the fact that if you're working, for, so for instance, myself, a white, male, heterosexual, able-bodied, um, doing work in disabilities. I am not going to present something about a student with a disability without having included them, without them given, having them share their voice. It's not my voice that you need to hear. Everything that I'm talking to you about today is through the voices of the students I've worked with, everything that I've learned from them, right? So keep in mind, anything that we decide to do to support anyone in diversity, include their voice. Make sure their voices are included. And that goes for a symposium like this. Make sure that you have a diverse uh, group of panelists that are presenting their perspectives. So when we're talking about field studies and disability, Understand the fact that full participation does not always mean 100% physical access to all activities. This is something that I constantly wrestle with, with people who think that they have to support a student in every single activity in a field study. And that is just not true. If I have a student who is a wheelchair user, and I know that there's gonna be sites on that field trip or that field course that they're just not gonna be able to physically get to, I'm not gonna tell them that they can't go. I'm gonna figure out ways to help them participate in the activities that still keeps them in this community of learning. Because it's not necessarily the science that's the most important thing here. It's the social community, it's being around your peers, it's learning from each other, it's being in this community. You separate them out from that by giving them an alternative assignment to perform or to do, then you've completely lost their interest in actually doing this work. This whole nothing about us without us, I'd like to draw your attention to a paper that just came out, it's online right now, um, that we published. Um, uh, it's exactly that, nothing about us without us. This was in response to a few papers that came out recently uh, about 
faculty who'd been working with autistic geoscience students and it was clear that the voices were not included. So I teamed up with three of my autistic colleagues to write a response to that. And I would encourage you all to look at this. This is an incredible first person perspective of what it's like to be autistic in our science discipline, straight from their voices. So um, feel free to email me. I can also send this paper to you, but it's freely available. It's, it's, uh, it's open sourced. Geo, Journal of Geoscience Education. So how do we go about doing it? Full participation requires full inclusion. Think about how you're promoting, you're recruiting, and you're selecting students for any activities, any field courses into your program, perhaps. Purposeful site selection, open communication and collaborative problem solving, multiple representation of the content materials, technology integration, community of learning across all activities, you know? So develop an inclusive community of, of learning. I'm gonna show you a few uh, examples of each of these and we'll talk about them quickly. The first things I'd like you to consider is how you're identifying the barriers to active participation. This was the very first question that I asked you to consider. What are the barriers of active participation? Plan collaboratively. Maintain flexible contingency planning. If we're focusing on the field, which this is, remember that full participation does not always mean 100% access to every activity or every aspect of that field site. So as an example, this was a, a trip that, uh, one of our accessible trips up in Vancouver. You could see folks down on the floodplain, and then you see the two individuals here uh, that were unable to get down on the floodplain. And so if you notice, um, one of them was looking at kind of a map of the area, the other one is looking at uh, a hand sample. You can see folks down on the floodplain. Everybody's kind of making observations individually at this point. But the most important piece of this is when everybody came back together and we held our debriefing session and we talked about the geology of the location and people were sharing observations and hand samples with everybody. Everyone was talking about what they had observed. This is the most important piece. Always make sure that all of your students or all of your participants are, at, are, are together when you're having these uh, debriefing sessions. This is an image of what we were talking about. In the background there, you see um, what we were all looking at. So none of us, could actually get there. That was an ice dam, a volcanic ice dam uh, that is now starting to deteriorate and the, the flooding in this area at Garibaldi Park is imminent. So no one is allowed to get up there anyway. So in terms of access, everybody had, uh, this was inaccessible for everyone. Second thing I want you to consider, deliberately integrate strategies to minimize those barriers, to enhance active participation and engagement. We do this through technology. This is in Flagstaff. We uh, took a group of people to uh, SP Crater, just right outside of Flagstaff. Clearly, you're not going to get everyone to the top of this volcano. So what do we do? We utilize the um, wireless network or the 3G or 4G network that was available to us there. And we used iPads to make sure that we shared images and videos back with the folks who could not get down or who, who could not get the top of the volcano. So here we have students that were in the vans looking at one of the prehistoric um, lava flows. Um, and so you see the image from the top and we were using video to share that with the folks who stayed back at the vans. This was the same group a year later, we took them to Ireland. This was about site selection, going to places where you had uh, everyone was able to make their observations from different perspectives. You have folks who are down along the river, which actually turned into a lake, uh, great outcrops down there, but not everybody could get there because of the, because of the uh, bog that everybody had to traverse to get to the sites. So we had site selection here where students could make observations along an old train trestle. Students down by the lake were able to make the same observations of their sites and utilize the videos to share with their colleagues along the train trestle. 
and to share those images back collaboratively, make their observations, right? Everyone had a job to do. It didn't matter what your ability was or was not. Everybody had an opportunity to make their own observations and then share those observations with their colleagues. And then finally, this isn't really the last thing you need to do. You really need to consider this thing first. What are the primary learning objectives? What are the objectives that you want your students to, to know, to do, um, as they are conducting these field experiments or, uh, or whatnot, all right? So we use multiple representation. And so multiple representation is a, one of the principles of universal design for learning. And to do that, we talk about communication. This was um, in, in, in Wales on the Isle of Anglesey. We established, a, used a tour guide system so that everybody didn't have to be all huddled up when we had those debriefing sessions or explanations. Um, it was windy, so therefore we could actually, people could stay on the outcrop where they were as we were doing this. We also used video to be able to share um, with people who were back the vans, who could not get onto these outcrops. So real-time video uh, explaining what we were seeing. Videos again, to be able to show exactly what we were looking at. But the multiple representation here was that everyone had access to uh, even if they could not get on the outcrop, they had access to hand samples, they had access to images and thin sections and um, information that not everybody did. And so the folks that were in the vans had access to information that the people um, who were on the outcrops did not have. So they were able to make observations that were there that were unique to them. And then they were able to share those observations back with their colleagues when we had our debriefing sessions. And here on the right is an image of the videos that we were having in real time so people were able to be in the uh, community of learning. Just another example of purposeful site selection here, going to a spot where everybody could get up to the outcrop. And then quickly, I'll just talk about, um, and some of you might uh, have been aware of the, 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 the immediate need to shift to dis designing remote field experiences this spring as a result of COVID-19. I would encourage you to check out the NAGT site, designing remote field experiences that we kicked off this spring. Uh, we had about 350 geoscience field educators come together in a matter of two months to put together a series of uh, online field experiences for students who were not able to get into the field. It seemed that everybody had an accessibility issue this year as a result of COVID-19. So check this out. There's a lot of freely available resources for you as an instructor or even all of our students. Going back to this, this is an example of one of them that we, that we discussed. This was the same uh, Wales experience on the last day that we were there. This is two years ago, so it was a great ex example to show here. Uh, we got rained out, so we had to use um, a virtual experience for our students to complete their field activities. So I give you the link here to the virtual landscapes at the University of Leeds. I would encourage you to check this out as well. Um, our students were able to complete their field activities as a result of all of the multiple representation that we had. They were able to complete their mapping projects. Um, they were able to collaborate with one another. This became an inclusive community of learning. Um, disability was not a factor at all, and that was the purpose here. And so we utilized all the different modes of, of representation, thin sections, hand samples, maps, all the different observations to come together. Um, it was a pretty cool thing. So this is a great, as we wrap up here, this is a great quote from one of my students from a project um, 10 years ago now. There was absolutely no sense or feeling that we were a nuisance, burden, or an overall pain to be taught because of our different needs. So when you can get to the point where your students realize that they can focus on the science rather than having a high, higher anxiety level because of how they're going to stand out or how they're going to be treated differently or, or how they're disability is gonna get in the way. 
think about how you're supporting those students. And if you're really interested to learn more about that, please get a hold of me. I'd love to talk to you. All the IAGD projects, all the work that I've done has been supported by these um, organizations. I'm very grateful for those. But again, if you're interested, I'd like to talk to you. So please, please reach out to me. That's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, we don't have too much time, but I will ask uh, you one quick question from the chat. Um, and of course, we will, uh, if we don't get to your questions, we will bring them back up during the Q&A portion of our session at the end. Um, one of the questions was, how, you know, in your experience, what are some of the ways that you can help uh, increase access, especially for those that are on the autistic spectrum? Um, in some of your personal experience working with the students? Yeah, so that's a really tough uh, question to answer because <clears throat> people, students in particular, I've worked with who are on the autism spectrum have all had different needs, right? So the biggest thing that I would encourage everyone to do as you start to consider how you're going to support a specific student is have a conversation with them because no one has the exact same needs. Um, really open up that line of communication, establish some trust and let them know that you are in, that you want to support them and you want them to participate to the best that they can to where they feel most comfortable. I, I can't sit here and give you any, with the exception of, of, of pointing you to the paper that just came out with that has a whole lot of different ideas of, of starting points. It's got to be a conversation between you and the student. That's the best that I could do right now until you get to know exactly what they need. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, we will now be uh, transitioning uh, to our next speaker. So we do have about three minutes uh, while we make this transition. So again, uh, take the time to get a move around. Uh, really quick, um, in lieu of registration fees for this year, uh, we do have uh, links on our PRI symposium website to uh, donations um, for uh, specifically for helping to increase inclusion, inclusion equity and um, diversity in paleontology and geosciences. So in lieu of registration, we uh, would like to extend the offer for you to make a donation. So uh, yeah, in three minutes, we'll be moving on to the next talk. Uh, again, uh, please populate the Q&A as we will be bringing them back up during the Q&A panel at the very end. Thank you. All right, we will now be moving on to our third and final talk of today's session. Uh, our last talk will be by uh, Dr. Jonathan uh, Hendricks, he is the Director of Science Communication at PRI and is also a, an Associate Professor, I believe, with Cornell University. Uh, John is also the creator of the uh, online resource, uh, the Digital Atlas. And so uh, John's talk today will be focusing on free resources for teaching paleontology online. John, take it away. Thanks very much, Matthew. And uh, I want to uh, just start off by thanking all of the organizers of this year's uh, symposium, as well as all the other presenters. The, the talks all um, have been wonderful so far, and, and uh, I'm sure all of the, the rest of the talks are, are going to be great as well. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I want to thank also everybody who's, who's decided to participate from around the world today. It's really great to have such a wide audience. So uh, as Matthew said, one thing I want to, um, the, the thing I want to focus on here today are free resources for teaching paleontology online. And, you know, of course, one at, uh, important aspect of equity in general is just access to materials for learning. And that's, that's what I kind of want to focus on here with my, with my presentation. Um, since 2008, I've headed up a project called the Digital Atlas of Ancient Life. And the focus of this project has always been the development of online resources to help uh, anyone, but especially avocational paleontologists, students, as well as their teachers, identify fossils and learn about Earth's ancient life. And so if you wanna um, follow along during my presentation, I encourage you to explore the Digital Atlas of Ancient Life website. I think the link has been put in the chat 
Um, it's just www.digitalatlasofancientlife.org. That's a, that's a long URL, I know. So you can also just do a Google search for Digital Atlas of Ancient Life and, and it'll, it'll come up. Um, so feel free to um, follow along as I, as I um, present this, this resource. One of the other things I want to note before sort of jumping into the different components of the Digital Atlas itself is just to highlight that there are, of course, many other great resources online for learning about uh, paleontology. Today I'm going to focus on the Digital Atlas, um, but there's many others. Um, one that I'd like to give a plug to that I really like is uh, the Time Scavengers blog, um, which um, provides a lot of great information about paleontology, but also the experiences of um, people at different career stages within the field of paleontology. And so I really encourage you to, um, to uh, check out the Time Scavenger blog as well. I really, really like that website. Um, so the Digital Atlas of Ancient Life uh, project, as I said, began in, in 2012. And initially the, the focus of the Digital Atlas project was to create online field guides to fossils from particular regions. And I'm gonna to touch on that uh, very briefly here this, um, this morning. But what I really wanna focus on are, are some of the um, educational materials that we've developed as, as part of this project subsequent to developing the online uh, field guides. So the different resources that I'm going to uh, chat about here in the next 15 minutes or so include um, the, the field guides, but also uh, some classroom exercises that have been developed, as well as the Digital Encyclopedia of Ancient Life online paleontology textbook and our virtual teaching collection of, of 3D models. So the first, uh, the first component of the Digital Atlas project that we, we developed were field guides to fossils from uh, different regions of the country. Um, of course, a, you know, a field guide to the birds of the world isn't especially useful because there, you know, there's, there's thousands of birds around the world. And if you want to know about the birds that um, live in your neighborhood, it's much better to have a regionally focused guide. And, and that was sort of the vision that we had for uh, the digital Atlas project. Um, we've created field guides to fossils from the Ordovician of the Cincinnati region, the Pennsylvanian um, of the American Mid-Continent, the Cretaceous of the Western Interior Seaway, and then also the Neogene um, fossil record of the Southeastern United States. I just wanna give you a, a quick glimpse of what, the, um, of what the Digital Atlas field guides look like in case you've never uh, seen them before. This is a, a shell of a snail near and dear to my heart. Here's a, a specimen of this uh, particular kind of shell. If, if you found this in a neogene deposit in the southeastern U.S. and you're trying to figure out what exactly um, this snail is and, and what species it is and, and you know what its stratigraphic record is, you could go to the neogene component of the Digital Atlas of Ancient Life. I'll bring up a, a link here. Um, you could go to the All Species page uh, tab at the top. And you can see that we've loaded hundreds and hundreds of different species of neogene snails into uh, just this component of the, of the neogene atlas. Um, we scroll down, eventually we get to snails that look a little bit like uh, the specimen I was holding up. And this specimen happens to have its opening on the, on the left-hand side. It's sinistral, which makes it um, conus adversarius. Bring up the, um, the page here for, for conus adversarius. And there's just different kinds of information, um, including its taxonomy, where, it, uh, where it's been found, as well as images. Sorry, I'm kind of futzing around here because I can't see my cursor. There we go. Um, so there, there's high quality pictures on the, on the digital atlas of, um, frankly, hundreds of species now from these different uh, time intervals. So it, you know, it's a great resource of just imagery of fossil specimens from, um, from different time intervals that you, can, uh, that you can share with your students. And all of these images have Creative Commons licensing. So you can, you can really do whatever you want with them for nonprofit purposes. Um, I want to mention also that related to the fossil field guides, we do have a mobile um, app available for iOS and Android. And on the Digital Atlas homepage, there's links if you want to download the, the mobile app version of the, of the Digital Atlas. Um, based on these uh, field guides to fossils from these different uh, regions and time periods, we've also created a number of um, curricular materials for students at a variety of age levels. So, 
Um, we have resources for elementary students, middle school students, um, as well as uh, advanced high school level students and, and college students. They use the digital atlases to try to answer different kinds of questions. And many of these um, curricular materials, especially the, the K-12 materials, are tied directly to, uh, to um, next generation science standards. Um, so I want to I want to spend the rest of my time talking about two particular um, resources that are part of the digital Atlas of Ancient Life project. The first of these is the digital encyclopedia of, of ancient life. Um, for any of those of you out there who teach at the college level or have taken a you know a college course recently, I don't I don't need to you know I, I don't need to tell you about how absurdly expensive textbooks are. You already know that. Um, since around the time that I was an undergraduate student in the late 90s, the cost of college textbooks has increased about 181%, uh, percent, whereas recreational books um, in terms of consumer price index have actually declined in, in cost over time. Um, illustrations within textbooks are, are sometimes very good, they're, but they're sometimes not particularly engaging. They're sometimes just regurgitations of images that have been, you know, reprinted um, in some cases for many, many decades. Copyright uh, issues can make the images onerous for instructors. And then, of course, uh, many of today's students uh, learn online um, as, well as, as well as within the classroom. Um, so the Digital Encyclopedia of Ancient Life is an online textbook about paleontology, fossils, and the history of life. It's completely open access. The content is free to access and use as you wish. Um, just about everything on it has both the text and the images themselves have Creative Commons licensing, again, meaning that you can more or less do with them what you want. Um, the intended audience for the Digital Encyclopedia of Ancient Life are, is really um, students taking their first sort of college level course in either paleontology or historical geology, but I think the materials are also um, perfectly appropriate for advanced high school um, level students as well as avocational paleontologists who just want to learn more about the field. Um, we've been working on the Digital Encyclopedia of Ancient Life for um, about four years now, and it's, it's nearing um, completion. There's still a few uh, holes that we're hoping to um, fill, but um, at least in terms of coverage of major concepts within paleontology, and also um, coverage of major, uh, at least macrofossil groups, we have, we really do have pretty good coverage. I want to go now to um, just the table of contents for the, for the Digital Encyclopedia of Ancient Life. You can access this off the homepage just by this drop down at the top that says Digital Encyclopedia. Um, scroll down. Um, these are just the, you know, the major topics that the, that the digital encyclopedia covers. We have chapter on the um, nature of the fossil record, geologic time, evolution in the fossil record, systematics, which includes both the practice of taxonomy as well as um, the business of, of building phylogenetic trees. Um, uh, Jansen Smith recently contributed two chapters on paleoecology and also uh, conservation paleobiology. And then we have a number of chapters just focused on individual groups. Um, we have uh, Phylum Periphera, which was recently contributed by uh, Jay Lee Peer, who's one of the um, uh, organizers of today's session. We have chapters on different kinds of corals. Jay Lee also contributed a chapter on brachiopods. Jansen contributed a, uh, a chapter on bryozoans. Um, we have uh, chapters on gastropods and cephalopods. We'll be adding a chapter soon on bivalves contributed by Warren Allman. Um, Jansen and Jay Lee both co-authored a chapter recently on, on phylum echinodermata, so um, crinoids and uh, sea stars and, and other animals. And then I've contributed a, a little bit on, um, the, uh, on basal chordate animals. And finally, Liz Hermsen's contributed a number of um, very detailed pages related to the evolution of uh, plants as well as their um, as well as their structure. So we have we have a lot of content online right now for the digital encyclopedia, um, and and I do encourage you to just sort of peruse the um, that content on your on your own time. Um, the the last major um, piece of the digital atlas of ancient life project that I want to um, chat briefly about uh, with you is the virtual collection. So if you um, go to the top of the digital atlas homepage, you click on virtual collection. 
you'll you'll come to our um, our collection of 3D models. Now, um, at PRI, we we teach um, the Cornell Paleobiology course, and uh, this is what our our teaching collection looks like. I'm guessing um, for those of you who um, teach college level paleontology courses. I'm sure you have collections that look something like this, uh, just a variety of hand samples that have been um, you know, handled by students for many, many decades um, that represent different uh, taxonomic groups. And so we of course arrange labs um, and lab questions so that students use these hand samples to try to um, learn something about uh, uh, paleontology. Um, teaching collections have huge benefits. Um, the the most important one, I think, being that they're, they're you know they're tangible items that um, they're tangible samples that students can hold in their hands and and learn uh, directly about fossils. And I think you know really the most important aspect of this is that they're awe inspiring. They they provide an authentic connection to deep time that you know pictures and other resources just cannot really um, offer in, in the same way. But there are limitations to, um, to teaching samples. Um, one of the important ones for, for students is they're generally not available to study outside the classroom. Usually we can't let students uh, go home with the, the fossil samples to study them on their own time. Um, not all teaching collections uh, provide a representative sampling of, of biodiversity. Some groups uh, are oftentimes underrepresented within um, a fossil collection for whatever reason. Key features are not always preserved in the specimens that are within a, a, a teaching collection. Specimens, um, at least the ones that I've used in my own teaching, um, have often suffered decades of use and abuse by students and, and some important specimens are sort of just ground down to, to little bits that, that make them hard to use for, for teaching after being appreciated by students for many, many years. Um, and then finally, and I think most importantly, some instructors just don't have access to physical teaching collections, or especially right now because of COVID, they teach um, their courses entirely online. And so to ad address these issues, we've created a virtual collection of 3D fossils um, at PRI that are derived from the best of the best specimens within our um, research collection, as well as um, from our teaching collections and also specimens that are on exhibit in the collections at, at PRI um, Museum of the Earth. So this is just an, uh, one example of one of our um, 3D uh, models that, that we've created over the past couple of years. This is a, a goniotite aminoid. Um, you can see that the 3D models themselves are, are fully uh, interactive. Um, students can load them up and, and explore the specimens as they wish by rotating them and, and zooming in on different features. Um, one of the neat things that we can do with the models as well is to annotate them. So we can, we can take specimens and then annotate features that are important for their identification. So in the snail, as you can see, a bunch of different uh, features of its morphology are being, are being highlighted. Um, we've created all of these models using a, a method called photogrammetry. I, I don't have time to go into that method right now. Um, Emily Hoff, who made many of these models along with Jay Lee Peer, created a, a guide to um, the process of photogrammetry that's on our Digital Atlas website. It's, it's a really great uh, cookbook style guide, step by step, of um, how you can um, create these models yourself. Um, the, the most expensive aspect of this process is um, it, basically the computer and, and camera setup, um, the software is not all that expensive and, and otherwise um, it's a fairly straightforward uh, process that um, presents and, and creates some really nice uh, samples that, that students are able to explore online. Um, so once we create the 3D models themselves, we post them to our Sketchfab page. Um, currently, we have uh, over 600 models on our Sketchfab account, so this is a live view of, of our Sketchfab page. If you don't know what Sketchfab is, you can sort of think about it as um, sort of the YouTube of 3D models, so people can upload their models to it. And uh, most of the models on Sketchfab are, are actually available for free. Um, we've put all of our models online, though, with um, either Creative Commons or, or uh, public domain licensing. So I'm going to load up this uh, um, megalodon tooth here. You can see it's I'm, I'm rotating it live right now, so you, you know you can you can um, 
uh, users can explore these, these models as, as they wish. I want to highlight just a couple of features of, of Sketchfab in case you don't know about them. First of all, if you um, like this uh, Megalodon tooth and you want to make a 3D print of it, you can just click the download button and uh, you can download the, the actual files. And these files um, can be read by a 3D printer and, and you can print your own copy. Um, you can also share these models uh, just by clicking the share button. You can, you can get a link. Um, but one thing that's really nice and that I use quite a bit myself is um, the embed feature. So you can click embed um, and then you can, I usually turn off auto start here because it makes your, your, page, your web pages load faster. You click copy and then you can dump this um, embedded code directly into a video box on a website. This also works in course uh, management uh, systems like Blackboard. Um, you, you can dump the code um, into a video field and you can embed the, the models directly into um, the web pages that, are you, that you're creating for your students uh, to learn from. So I think that's, that's very neat. I'll show you an application of that here in just a second. Um, so we've taken this virtual collection of over 500 um, uh, uh, specimens from uh, PRI's collection and we've incorporated them into an organized uh, virtual collection on the Digital Atlas homepage. Again, right up here at the top is the, is the top banner. Here's virtual collection. So that's how you get to that page. Um, you can think about this as being akin to the drawers of specimens that an instructor might put out on a, on a lab bench during a, during a class. Um, I want to highlight here that we have a user guide for um, suggestions on, on how you might um, consider using the, the virtual collection. But all of these groups are just organized uh, taxonomically. I'll scroll down quickly here and go to cephalopods, um, just so you can kind of see what's in there. Um, we can go to aminoids. Here's our, our page with all of the aminoid specimens that are currently in the, the digital um, encyclo uh, sorry, in the, in the digital atlas virtual collection. So we've got many, many different models. Um, I think these are handy when you're um, teaching your, your students. For instance, if you're sharing this virtual collection uh, during uh, a class, you can load a specimen just like this. Um, you know, you can, you can rotate it around and show features. One thing I like doing is just to go full screen size with it so your students can really um, see it. This is really handy if you're presenting these specimens um, in front of a classroom when we, when we get back to that uh, time, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, this is much more useful than holding up a small hand sample when you've got a class of, you know, over 100 students where nobody can see it or when, you know, we, we pass specimens around the classroom. And by the time a student in the back sees the specimen, you've already moved on to, to four others. Um, so I think it's useful for, for classroom presentations as well. Um, we've got, like I said, many, many different uh, virtual collections now online in this collection. We've got everything ranging from uh, microfossils to um, vertebrates and, and fossil plants. Most major groups of macroinvertebrates are, are in particular very well represented now in the, in the virtual collection. Um, these virtual collection models have also been incorporated into the digital encyclopedia of ancient life that I spoke about earlier. Just as one example, here's the digital encyclopedia page on uh, tabulate corals. Scroll down through the page, there's information about tabulate corals and their, their history. Um, they provide nice interactives within the page. So students learning about um, tabulate corals, here's some features highlighted in this image, and then there's that same specimen and load the model and the, the student can interact and explore with the, the model as they're, as they're learning. Um, the one final thing that I wanted to plug here is that um, the most common piece of feedback that I've received from instructors who have been using the, the virtual collections, especially um, because of COVID last semester was that they provide some obstacles during assessment activities like quizzes and exams. And, and the problem is that the specimen name, the taxonomic identification is often um, presented in the upper left-hand corner when you take these models and you embed them in your own web page. And that unfortunately is something that I cannot control on my end. The only way to get rid of that is to purchase a very expensive Sketchfab account, which um, we're, we're not able to do. So to address this issue, um, we are right now 
working on creating a new collection of over 50 3D models that will not have any identifying information. Um, we're putting these on Sketchfab. A link's gonna be necessary to view them, but we wanted to make this special collection that you can use in your, in your own teaching um, this fall. I'll be making an announcement um, sometime before the fall semester uh, begins, hopefully uh, by later this month that will um, announce this, this new collection and how you can access it for your own uh, teaching. Um, so to summarize, you know, we've, we've created a bunch of different resources um, on the digital atlas that you can use in your own teaching. Um, they can be used, I think, in many, many different ways. If you have used them in your own teaching, um, I'd love for you to, to share your suggestions with everybody um, in, the, in the chat. So um, please do that. Um, I'd also like you to take the opportunity during our discussion in a little while um, to share some of the ways that, that you may have used them in your own teaching. Um, one final thing that I want to um, just sort of make a, a teaser plug for here is to, um, to please look for a major announcement from PRI in a couple of weeks about our next major um, project related to online earth science education. Stay tuned for uh, an announcement about that. Um, finally, um, many, many, many people have contributed to the Digital Atlas project, and I, I want them uh, uh, to be recognized. I also want to um, thank the and, and recognize the National Science Foundation for, for supporting this work. Um, thanks very much. Great. Thank you so much, John. Uh, before we move on to the Q&A and bring everyone back in, I do want to ask you specifically a couple of quick questions mm -hmm. that we got. Um, so one of the ones uh, was, is there any uh, attempt or, or is there a work in progress to uh, translate the digital atlas into more than one language uh, so that it can be um, used by other researchers internationally? Super, super question. Um, it's not something we're doing right now, but it's, loved, it, it's something I would love to see happen. And there, there is a potential opportunity for that down the road that I'm thinking about. Um, it, it won't happen in the near term just because of, of limited resources that we're, we're facing right now. But it, I, I'd love to go in that direction down the road. Perfect, thank you. Um, and another quick one. Uh, it does seem like there are a lot of people who have been using uh, this resource. And one of them was wondering uh, the plans for when the chordate section will be expanded. <laughs> I have to admit, so I'm a, I'm an invertebrate paleontologist and I work on snails and um, the, the chordates have been, um, the chordates have been a, a challenge. And so I, I, you know, I'd like to say that if, if anybody out there would like to help contribute to a chordate chapter, you know, please do, please do get in touch. I've, I've worked on um, basal chordates. I'd love to get more coverage of vertebrates within the, um, you know, within the digital encyclopedia, but um, yeah, that, that, that's one of the major pieces that we still need to complete. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You. Uh, so we are going to transition now into our Q&A panel. So I'd like to invite back uh, all of our speakers, Chris, Cam, and John, uh, to uh, enable your, uh, your video and, your, and to unmute yourselves. Uh, this portion will be sort of a back and forth between both me and our Q&A moderator, Karen. Uh, we will be asking uh, you questions both directly and also asking questions uh, to everyone involved. So I'm going to uh, start out um, asking a question. Uh, one of the ones um, that was directed, uh, that is one of our most uh, upvoted questions uh, is for uh, Cameron. Uh, what are things that you think society should do um, for helping those of the that are in underrepresented uh, communities, it, especially you know things that we can do together as society and as also a science community to help those underrepresented groups? Oh, sorry, you're uh, you're muted, Cameron. Okay, you guys can hear me, right? Yep, all good. Okay, great. Um, uh, so one of the things that I really have touched upon is, or one of the things that I really would like to talk about is, you know, perpetuating stereotypes among 
um, people of color and people who are on the um, autism um, spectrum or people with disabilities in general. Um, and that's one of the things that I really thought about of how society could better take away from people who are, you know, who are who, people who have disabilities and for people who say are, um, are um, ethnic, are ethnically diverse. And so one of the things is stereotypes. We need to get rid of various stereotypes. And again, one of the things that I talked about in my other talk was getting rid of the stereotypes among paleontologists and what a scientist should look like. Because again, not all scientists are these, you know, you know, not all scientists know every single thing. You know, there's various scientists who have, um, who specialize in various different things. And there's scientists who need help on just um, basic communication skills or mathematics or things like, uh, things of that nature. And so one of the things that I like to talk about um, from that perspective is getting rid of the various stereotypes among um, people of color, um, scientists, and the African-American community. So I think that's how, or just one of the things um, that the society could, you know, stop doing. Um, it's it's it doesn't. It's not just one thing. Um, it's hard to answer the question because you know there's various different things that society um, could, you know, get away from. But that's one of the things that I would definitely um, express a lot more. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, our next question kind of is to all panelists, so feel free to jump in, anybody. And it's generally about how to engage uh, traditionally or not typically represented groups, such as adults in underrepresented groups. Um, where should we be focusing our science communication and outreach efforts to engage younger people of diverse backgrounds? And if anyone has any resources to share for um, communities such as like Facebook groups for young autistic aspiring scientists and other maybe non-professional uh, or enthusiast groups, feel free to answer now. I'd, I'd jump in there really quick and just point to what Cam's been doing, uh, going to Fernbank, sharing his own personal, uh, his own personal collection, reaching out to the students, going to the elementary schools. I mean, there's a lot of things that we're not doing enough of, and I think that he's showing us firsthand what we should be doing to reach a lot of the students that aren't typically considering these these disciplines as a career option or some or, or to pursue it. Um, show me an elementary student who uh, isn't interested in dinosaurs or fossils or anything like that, right? And then by the time they get up into high school, they've lost that interest because they're just not they're not they're not shown that they don't have opportunities to expand on their knowledge so i think that g going deeper into k-12 um and especially the the public outreach at the museum centers like cam's been doing um, is a great start yeah i i completely agree with everything that that chris just said completely agree yeah one of the things um so that's what that's been main, one of my main goals is to trying to take paleontology to um, to various schools, to various places where it may not be talked about. Um, because paleontology is such an important thing to understand. You know, deep time is something that is very, very passionate to me. And kids who have an interest in paleontology and dinosaurs, who's never seen a dinosaur fossil before, who's never picked up a fossil before, and having that engagement for various people um, because paleontology is everywhere. I mean, not everybody has the access to go out in the field and collect fossils and even go to museums. Um, I didn't have that um, going to just going to various museums. Um, but having fossils in my collection and people who are giving me fossils in my collection started out that interest and it allowed me to bring other people who who are minorities and people who didn't have those advantages to um, to bring fossils into light and have that opportunity engage with fossils. Yeah, and I, I, I completely agree with, with Cam on that. I mean, I think we can all, you know, th there's all sorts of opportunities for all of us, you know, to get out to museums or even give online presentations to all different groups about, you know, about fossils and, and what we're passionate about. That passion will um, help to get other folks uh, engaged and, and interested. 
Great, wonderful. Oh, sorry, Chris. Yeah, just, just, just one one quick follow up there. You know, when you're when you're wanting to do that kind of outreach, you know, make sure that we you know go beyond just the passion and the interest, but actually look at what the career opportunities are as well. Um, you know, a lot of the times that, that parents probably don't encourage our students enough to go for what they're passionate in doing if they don't see the obvious advantages of doing so. So if you're talking about your passions, great, keep doing that, but also maybe start aligning those career opportunities available to them as well. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Uh, Chris, do you think you could sort of follow up about, you know, about these uh, career opportunities, elaborate a little bit more uh, about that, about how we can really show that and, and express that to, to those that are interested? Um, yeah, I think jumping into that, I, I think that we need to be very aware, like I said before, that, that how we're promoting our science. You know, the easiest thing to promote is the exciting, the adventurous parts of our science, but we're not obviously promoting the things that are more laboratory based, um, more the day to day uh, things that we do, the activities that we do. And a lot of times those day to day things that we do are very accessible and very inclusive. So if we're not promoting those things, then what is it that we're actually, we're trying to replace ourselves in a discipline when we're not actually looking to become more diverse. We're just trying to bring in more people that are looking for excitement and adventure. Um, so the career opportunities that exist, I mean, it, 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 in terms of the geosciences in general, aren't very field focused as much as they used to be when we were still doing a lot of the mapping and, and, and those types of activities. Um, a lot of the things that we do are very computer based and very data intensive. And a lot of those careers are very accessible, especially in the museum centers. There's a lot of accessibility there that, that we're just not adequately promoting. Um, so I think that when any of us are looking to promote jobs, I think that we all need to consider the barriers and the accessibility, the, the opportunities for people to do these types of jobs that aren't the typical types of scientists that we bring in. You know, think about the advantages of having diverse perspectives in our, in our, in our, in our, uh, in our communities, in our job communities, in our workforce. Yeah, I definitely agree with Chris on that. Um, definitely talking about some of the various career opportunities that many people can have, you know, when it comes to having a career in science. In regards to paleontology, um, I think many people have this perspective of paleontology as just sticking up dinosaur fossils, and that's not, that's not what paleontology is at all. And so we can definitely cut down the stereotypes in regards to various fields of science, whether that's paleontology, chemistry, physics, biology, any of those various fields of science. And so definitely having career in, in, in the science field or in the STEM fields, um, to be more exact, is, is definitely something that we have to keep uh, a lookout on and we have to promote um, a lot more than just all the exciting, cool things. Because, oh, cool, yeah, you have a fossil. But what, could, what kind of career can you kind of make out of um, your passion? What type of thing can you use fossils for? And another thing that I kind of want to really talk about um, just based on what Chris said, is um, the uh, scientific concepts, um, bringing those scientific concepts to light. Because you can talk about fossils and various things, but maybe talk about stratigraphy. You know, it is definitely a broad subject, but you can definitely talk about those various, um, various topics into uh, the community. You know, how to date rocks, um, uh, radiometric dating, you know, um, biostratigraphy, deep time, all these various subjects that are very important to the core of uh, to the core of geoscience. Great, uh, thank you so much. Um, I have a, a some more uh, specific questions um, because there's a lot of interest from uh, other faculty and professors that are you know wanting to start implementing some of this. Um, so I have uh, two questions. One will be for Chris, and one will be for John. Uh, the question for for Chris is um, they're wondering about some of the uh, if you could provide or, or sort of elaborate on some of the resources that you've used, especially for field-based research. Um, and also, you know, kind of also keeping in mind that, you know, a lot of academies and, and you know, researchers may not necessarily have the funding to really go out and get those really big expensive ones. Uh, 
And then after that, uh, my question for John is uh, specifically more so about the um, uh, digital atlas and people wondering, you know, they, they find it a wonderful resource and they would also like to start up things like that in their own home country. And they would like some pointers on how they would, could do that. So we'll start out with uh, Chris. Um, yeah, so uh, if, if you all are keeping an eye on the q and A, I I put some, uh, some information in the Q&A about uh, with some papers and, and things that we've done. The, uh, when we did the, the, the Arizona and then the Ireland trip, we actually started to look at technology and, and we were using some of the tech that was very readily available from iPads to two-way radios, um, very simple, low-tech uh, options like that. Um, when we integrated the iPads using the 3G and 4G wireless networks, we started to realize that the um, there was by sharing video across those, you started to get a big lag time. So it, it really started to become a detriment to sharing um, videos across that. When we moved the trip the following year to Ireland, we actually set up our own wireless network in the field. And so we took a bunch of equipment in and I can share information about that um, where we set up our own wireless network. It wasn't like the uh, connecting to the internet, but we created a little internet bubble in the field. We were in the middle of nowhere in Ireland. So there was no uh, phone networks or anything that we could connect to. So setting up this wireless network in the field actually completely cut that uh, lag time in the video down so that our students who were by the lake and the outcrops of the lake and the students that were along the train trestle could communicate in real time, sharing video, sharing things that they were seeing um, and with their peers. So they were grouped up according to having a partner at the, at the lake and having a partner at the, on the train trestle uh, specifically so that they could come back at that evening and share the observations that they made to create their own maps about that. Um, and so what we've done since then is uh, my colleague Anita Marshall at the University of Florida uh, has, she wrote a successful grant to purchase equipment. So we have, the IEGD has two complete sets of the field equipment that we used to conduct those activities that are completely available or they will soon be available for loan to anyone who wants to utilize those. So. Um, Keep an eye on the IEGD website. We will start promoting that soon with ways of, of uh, applying to utilize those, uh, those equipment and um, to integrate that in. There's a paper that I did put in that was, that's coming out in GSA today, uh, next month in September, that really kind of goes through the equipment that we used in the field. So do check that out. It's freely available online right now. So I put the link into the uh, Q&A for that but feel, feel free to reach out. If any of you are interested in, in accessing that equipment or learning more about how to use various equipment in the field technology to create that access and inclusion, feel free to reach out to me. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, John, back to you about uh, ways in which, you know, other people from, from other institutions or countries can start up their own version of a, of a digital atlas. Yeah, so, you know, when, when we started the, the digital atlas project, you know, eight years ago or so with the field guides, we were just sort of focused on, um, you know, stuff that the different material that the different partner institutions had close at hand. And that would be my first piece of advice is just, you know, start with, start with what you have easy access to and, and focus on that material. Our, our main motivation initially with the Digital Atlas project um, before we, you know, before we made the 3D models, before we made the digital encyclopedia, was just to create resources so that, you know, people could could identify the fossils that they were finding near where they they lived, and we'd love to continue to sort of broaden the coverage of the of the digital atlas field guide um, program, both nationally and and internationally. Right now, we've just had the resources to focus on these on these few areas, but you know, there's a real limitation out there in terms of um, resources to help people, you know, put put names to fossils, a lot of, um, a lot of images. So I found in my own work that many um, fossil species are only represented online by, a, by an image behind a paywall. And so, you know, that's a, that's a really big challenge. One thing I, I say to folks is that, 
uh, you know, especially professionals who are, you know, writing, writing papers and describing new taxa or, or re-describing old faunas is, you know, take pictures of your specimens and, you know, give them public domain licensing and put them out there before you ever publish the, you know, the paper. Let's, let's get, you know, get images out there and behind, um, you know, let, let's prevent them from being, from being permanently paywalled. Things are getting a little better. A lot of museums are digitizing their collections and those images are, are going online, but the, the digital atlas field guides were sort of meant to sort of provide a, a curation of, of all those different um, images and make them a little bit more user friendly than just having to, you know, sort of search through online databases for images of one taxon or, or another. Um, and I think the same really goes for the, you know, the digital encyclopedia and the um, 3D models as well. There, there is a cost to getting involved with making the 3D models, but if you already have a camera and a, a computer with a bit of power, it's not, it's not a horrible additional um, cost. And, you know, the more models that people make within the community and share, the, the better it is for everyone. And, and people are getting more into this and there's a lot of great, uh, models now being created. And once these are online, you know, there's all different ways in which people can share them. And I'm really looking forward to, you know, just sort of, sort of seeing the creativity of the field over the next few years as people take the 3D models that they've made and, or that others have made and, and just share them and use them in different ways for education moving forward. So to summarize, you know, just, um, Focus on what you have, what you have close at hand. We we began with what was close at hand, and and that's where you start. Wonderful, thanks for that. Um, our next question is for Cam. Um, does do you ever experience feeling like an outsider, and how do you work past it to put yourself out there? Um, I do feel like an outsider sometimes, definitely, especially you know among these. Actually, yeah, if, if I've been an outsider, I felt like an outsider all throughout my life. So that feeling definitely, um, def definitely is familiar to me. Um, and I definitely do feel like an outsider putting myself out there, especially among, you know, people who are very, you know, highly elite, you know, people with PhDs and things like that. So I definitely feel like an outsider, especially when I was in um, going to my first scientific conference and presenting uh, my first poster at GSA last year. I definitely felt like an outsider, but you know you don't want to have those particular uh, those specific mindsets to have. You want to feel like that you're just as important and part of that community, and that's how I felt. You know, when I was at GSA, um, when I first felt when I was first going to GSA last year, I definitely felt like an outsider. But having people welcome welcoming you into the sciences, the field definitely feels like you know you're you're opening your welcome to various different organizations and people who take in take an interest just how you take an interest in uh, some of the various fields in paleontology so yes definitely feeling like an outsider is definitely um it's definitely common but you definitely have to not think of it that way that you know there are organizations there are people who uh want to listen what listen to what you have to say and there are people who really feel like that you are just as important as a person who may have a PhD or who's teaching at a university right now. So yes, definitely feeling out, feeling like an outsider is definitely something that I am used to feeling, but it's something that I have tried to, you know, ignore over the past few years and learn that I'm just as important as other people in the community um, in the STEM fields. I have a follow up to that. It's I'm glad that you feel that there's some welcoming um, and parts of the community are welcoming to you. And I was wondering if there were particular like initiatives, like a mentor that you had or a mentorship program that uh, one of the societies you might've joined had that might've helped that. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, um, when I first moved um, back in high school, um, I got connected with the Georgia Mineral Society. And I've, I've had various um, people who take me under their wing, and specifically about high school teachers and teachers in general. Um, teachers definitely helped me get to where I am today. Um, I've had various teachers. I have an earth science teacher back in the sixth grade 
who took an interest in geology with me. He was a um, earth science teacher and he and I would identify rocks together. He and I would spend some time talking about geology together. And so he definitely helped me with that. And I've had some other various teachers in that way, but going into the Georgia Mineral Society part, um, when I was you know, moving and getting ready to start my freshman year of high school, um, I got connected with a um, geologist there um, whose name is Bill Wagner and he took me under his wing and we started to um, uh, go into various libraries and organizations and talk about geology with various students. And we were going and doing lectures um, at various um, school and at school events. And so he being a primary factor of one of my mentors has definitely helped me with communication and being able to put myself out there. Um, so mentors, uh, mentors, of course, are, are really, really important to have. And a lot of the people that I have in my life, or including my parents who supported my interest in geology and paleontology and taking me to those talks and taking me to lectures, um, going on to fossil collection trips um, that I didn't have access to at the time when I was younger. And so having those particular people in your, people in your life and uh, leading you to that, um, to that path in your life is definitely important. So if anybody can have any type of mentor or organization with important people that you think are really uh, are important to have, um, definitely consider having that and, and having people who promote your interests. And um, I've had a couple of other paleontologists and geologists who really helped me get to where I am now. Um, I wouldn't be going to GSA um, presenting at my first scientific conference if it wasn't for the various geologists and paleontologists who funded that trip and also for the Time Scavengers community who helped me get to uh, my first scientific conference. So having those people in your life and having those mentors is really important. So yeah, that's, that's definitely something that I, I, am, I am blessed to have. Great, thank you so much, Cameron. And as we reach near the end of the, of the Q&A panel, I wanted to extend one more question to all of our speakers. And that is if, if you are talking to a person, say young or old, with disabilities or from an underrepresented background, you know, what is something you would say to them if they are interested in joining geosciences or paleontology? Advice, feedback, or, or just words of, of wisdom from your own, from what you've experienced? Yeah, I, I think just following up on what, what Cam said is super important is, is find a mentor and um, help, that, help that person find it. If, if you can't be a mentor for that person, help them find a, a mentor who can, who can help guide them. You know, a person close to where they live, for instance, that who you might, who you might know who you think would be a good mentor. Yeah, a lot of times mentors aren't, you know, I, I agree with you, John. Um, a lot of times the mentors, especially if you're looking at the identity, um, you know, you can find a science mentor pretty easily, but finding a science mentor that, that matches the identity of the individual as well, whether it's totally. race, gender, ethnicity, disability status is often difficult. Putting them in touch with, uh, with uh, the diversity, a professional society or a society that focuses on diversity, NABG, for instance, or IAGD or any of those, um, just connecting them to the community somehow, um, but not just saying, hey, reach out to them, not just putting it all on them, actually mm -hmm. support them in that, stay with them and say, yeah, I'll help you connect with the community. Don't just kind of throw them out there because it's scary. It's scary to try to reach out on your own. I'm sure, Cam, you, you feel sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a little bit scary to kind of uh, blaze your own trail here, isn't it? Yeah, it's definitely, um, it's, it's definitely scary, um, you know, having people who have an interest in geology. In fact, I was just talking with a person um, who is interested in paleontology. He's studying geology at a, um, at a college right now, and he's interested in working on um, ankylosaurs. He's working on th um, armored dinosaurs. And I, um, I reached out to Jim Kirkland, um, who's the Utah State paleontologist, and I asked him if he could um, reach out to this particular individual who really wants to study armored dinosaurs because Dr. Jim Kirkland does study armored dinosaurs and Jim Kirkland got, got with him and he invited him on um, a, a dig next summer to dig up some um, armored dinosaurs that they're working on in Dolings Bowl and other various locations in Utah. So sometimes you feel like that being a mentor should, because it is a, 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 it is a important but a large job. And sometimes you feel that you 
you yourself may not have that in you to do something um, that other people would consider doing or something that isn't looked at um, as important to other people, but having a mentor, having a person that is able to lead you on a path of, of science or a path of education is something that is really important. It may be difficult to do to yourself, but you know you can have that and, and use that for other people. And one of the things that I thought was important to have is just being supportive. Um, if they do go off to an interest in paleo, uh, you know, go off to an interest in paleontology. It's easy to wheel them back in, but you also want to support their different interests because they may have an interest in a, a different various field of science. It may not be paleontology. It may not be geology. Wherever it is that they are interested in, in regards to the STEM fields, know that you're going to be supportive no matter what. You know, not all, not everybody is going to have a career in paleontology. Not everybody is going to become a paleontologist. But at least have, but at least know that you are part of that community to help other people going to various films of science. You know, uh, having an interest in paleontology may lead them to being a, um, a computer analyst, may lead them down the path of the medical fields of science. So know that you installing that um, passion within paleontology um, has will lead to other various different things and different interests so they can broaden their interest in science. Wonderful, thank you so much. I want to thank uh, everyone for joining us for our first session of this symposium and a huge thank you to our presenters and speakers for agreeing to join us today and speak and, and talk with everyone. I would like to uh, remind those attending uh, that there are donation links uh, on our PRI website for you to donate to causes to help increase inclusion, diversity and equity in paleontology and geosciences. Um, and also to please fill out the feedback survey of you know, what we've done right for this session. You know, what are things you think we should improve upon for the next time we do a symposium like this? Uh, we will be uh, ending uh, the webinar in about, I would say about five, 10 minutes probably. Um, and it will be starting back up right before our second session, which will be at uh, one o'clock uh, Eastern time or five o'clock universal time, uh, at PM, I should say. Um, and during this last, you know, 10 minutes, you know, this is your chance to, you know, if you wanted to connect with other attendees in the chat or for our panelists, if there's any questions you were unable to answer, um, you can take the time to, to answer those questions. And so, thank you. <laughs>